It's about ready, son. Let me know when we have a green light to go on these things. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 3. The book of Judges, chapter 3. We're working our way through this book, and we're observing... The first two chapters were kind of introductory in nature, and it was showing us kind of as it rolled in from the book of Joshua, the concept that at that particular time there was, of course, God, and what he was doing was he was working through one leader, Joshua, and through that one leader he was working over the entire nation and overruling the nation through the leadership of one man that was following him after his heart. And of course, we saw that in the book of Judges, though, in chapter 2, how the people began to turn away from the Lord. And now we're going to get into the actual narrative of the story of the book, as we'll see a number of departures that the nation takes from God. And then, of course, we'll see the goodness of God in raising up a deliverer. But basically what's happening here is what the Lord is doing now is he may raise up a particular judge, but the judge will tend to be not over the whole nation, he'll be over one region of the nation. And so now God is working particularly through one judge over one region. He's no longer particularly working, you know, generally working over one leader over the whole nation. We've come to a point where the nation itself has kind of uh, departed from the Lord. Uh, I take you... Well, keep your finger where you are in Judges there and just jump to the New Testament because this is the issue that will be happening in a number of places. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. This is kind of what's happening to the folks. Uh, I know if you were to study a lot of uh, traditional and even contemporary writing on the church and on the Bible, you would see the word apostasy. And, and that's pretty much to, to stepping away from what God has done. But the, the Lord will describe it this way. In, in his word, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. And this is the issue that's happening in the book of Judges. Uh, take heed, uh, brethren, writing to Hebrew people, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The issue that we're dealing with here, they call it apostasy, but God calls it departure. It's departing from God. It's no longer going toward God. It's being forward and walking away from God and departing from God. Uh, you saw that. What was the issue? Departing from the living God. That's the issue. What's happening in Judges, uh, the nation as a whole. Back up a few books to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, this is an age-old problem that the Lord must deal with uh, in his people. He's certainly not dealing with it in lost people. They're not even, they've never been close to him. But in his own people, in his own children, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, looking at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. We used to have a paper in town called the Courier Express, yeah. and they would bring that paper to us. Okay, now here's the Spirit speaking expressly, wants to rush that news to us. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And, and this is the issue that was going on in Judges. They were departing from the living God. That, that is a departure from, the notice, the faith. Okay, There's one God and there is one faith. There you go. Is that simple? There's one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there is one faith that was once delivered to the saints. Well, they keep writing a new Bible every year. Well, that can't be God at work, right? God doesn't multiple times deliver his faith unto his saints. Most of the people writing those Bibles, a good number on those committees are unsaved people. Uh, so, so they're not even his saints. When would he commit his word to lost people? Going back to where we're in Judges. So what we're looking at is we're looking at departures from the living God, departures from the faith. And, and God now will begin in chapter 3 where we will see two departures. Departure number one 
and departure number two. And we'll see how God deals with it. But before, just before he gets into the historical narrative of what will happen, he's going to give us a little introduction in verses one through four. Because he, he still wants to get us on the theme and a little bit of an understanding. And we see God's wisdom here. Uh, God's wisdom. You know, God is wise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, God is wise. Try and convince the average man of that. He doesn't believe it. Try and convince the average Christian of that. They don't believe it either. But, but Paul wants to explain that, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Exclamation mark. How unsearchable are his judgments in his ways past finding out. Exclamation mark. So then how do we find it out? Deuteronomy 29, the things which he's revealed to us are for us and our children. You're holding it in your lap. You're holding that. I was telling the young boy at, at uh, university the other day, uh, a law student, I said, son, <laughs> here's the truth, son. Here it is. Because he was, he was a bright kid. He was showing me all kinds of scientific evidence that he had from neurobiology. And then he was showing me some philosophical evidence that he had from some Eastern writings. And I said, son, you know, there's only three types of knowledge on planet Earth. There's the body of empirical scientific knowledge. It's done by experimentation. We call it a posteriori. Big fancy Latin word means it comes after we've done an experiment and collected the data. Science. And then I said, then there's a, another level of knowledge up here. It's called philosophy. It includes psychology and include theology of most religions, not Bible, but theology, but, you know, religions around the world. And I said, and that is an um, exercise of the mind that we call a priori knowledge. That's where you can do a thought experiment and just ruminate on certain things. He said, yeah, I agree with you. There's a lot of that. I said, and son, there's a third type of knowledge. It, it's, it transcends those two. It's called revelation. And, and in the depths and the riches of God, his wisdom and knowledge, his judgments are unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. You can't get them by science and philosophy. That's why you're warned, Timothy. Beware of science falsely so-called. If there's a science that says it can lead you to God, you, you've been deceived. You cannot find God out by science. Well, well, I'm just hoping creation science will prove God. It won't. Creation science will prove that God's record and testimony of himself is true, but it won't prove God for you. Philosophy can't prove God, which is why Colossians warns you in chapter 2, beware of philosophy and vain deceit. That won't do it either. But revelation, that will do it. The wisdom of God, he brings it down from above. That's the only way you get it. I said, son, you've got to read it and take it by faith. You've got to read it and look up, is this true? You know what will happen if you do that? You'll find out it's true. It's the heart. It'll communicate with the mind. Judges 3. God's wisdom. Number 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left. <laughs> Thank you. These are the nations which the Lord left. Last chapter he told you, verse 21, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. God now is leaving nations. Why? These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Even as many of Israel has had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At, at least such as before knew nothing thereof. Now he's going to name you the five the nations he's leaving, namely the five lords of the Philistines. These are the rulers of Ashdoth and Gath and, and the five cities uh, up there. And all the Canaanites and all the Sidonians and all the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. What we're seeing here is in verse 1, these are the nations which the Lord left. 
We're going to see why. But he left them, and it's an evidence of his wisdom. What's happening here? God is manifesting his wisdom. He's actually leaving these nations for their advantage. Can you imagine that? This is actually for the betterment of the people. So what's happening here is God is permitting these nations. He could have cleared them out. You know, God could wipe them out in a moment's time. Easily. He could wipe them out by a thought. He could wipe them out by twinkling his nose. He could wipe them out by sending down arrows of lightning. He could send legions of angels. He could send down hailstorms. He could do earthquakes. He could open the ground up and have them sucked right in. He could do anything he wanted. He could use a flood again. But he leaves them there as a manifestation of his wisdom. And they're actually for the advantage of the people, his people. Now you say, why would you do that? Well, the reason he does it is, I'll show you a number of reasons, one of which is just as a matter of manifest, manifesting his judgment and justice for their frowardness. You, you, you know, my, the greatest psalm in the Bible, you know, to me that I really like is that long one, Psalm 119. You ever read that psalm? It's all about the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. I don't know who wrote it. Many people think David wrote it. It's, it's anonymous. It's not actually, does not record who wrote it. I don't know if Asaph wrote it or one of the sons of Korah wrote it. I don't know if Moses wrote it. I don't know who wrote it. But all through there, it talks about the Word of God. Oh, I cried unto thee, I shall keep thy testimonies. I esteem thy precepts concerning all things to be right. The entrance of thy words giveth light. I hate vain thoughts, but I, oh, thy law do I love. He goes all through this talking about the Word, talking about the Word, talking about the Word. And then he, you know how he ends it? You know the last verse of that psalm? Here's a guy been talking, he's just been bragging on the Word of God for 175 verses. You see the last thing he writes? Look how he closes that psalm. Look at the last verse, Psalm 176. I have gone astray like lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Excuse me? All right, which one of you has not gone astray like a lost sheep? You do love the Lord, don't you? Yes. You do even theoretically love his book, don't you? Yes. Have you gone astray? Yes. Okay, we all do. Mm -hmm. Lord understands that. He's been around longer than we have. Yeah. So, so you know what he does? In a manifestation of his judgment, he leaves nations around to prove us for our advantage. Because he knows we tend to go astray. So he has a few things out there to kind of hedge us in. That, that's for our advantage, folks. That's why there's Canaanites on this side and Hittites on that side and Parasites on that side to say, you don't want to go out there. It's scary. Amen. Stay in where it's safe. Amen. That's, our, that's, that's good. Yeah. That's the goodness of God. Another reason he does it is he does it so that we would know some hardship. We need to know hardship. We can't afford to be lying back on our ivory beds in luxury watching TV and eating potato chips. I mean, the, the Jews couldn't do that and neither can the Christians. I mean, he says in 2 Timothy, you know the verse, uh, chapter 2. I remember one day we were out door knocking and it was a bitter January day. And we were walking in this one region way out there in farming community and we're walking down these long farming roads and the wind was howling across the plains. It wasn't Oklahoma, folks. It wasn't Kansas. And it was cold and it was bitter cold and my fingers were cold and my toes were cold. And my partner said, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2, 3, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Why? We're in a battle. So he left those nations so that they could endure hardness. He left those nations so that Israel would, would reproduce and breed soldiers. Israel must needs breed soldiers. If you lived on an island, you'd need to breed mariners, right? I mean, you just need to. God says, my people need to be soldiers, so let me leave some testing grounds to breed them into men of God that will stand and fight 
for the truth. Fight the good fight of faith. I need some men that will stand. And doing all they will continue to stand. I don't need men to sit down and point with their fingers. So he's breeding those folks. He's trying to do that with us too. He's also doing it by leaving these nations and these testings making us tough. He's discouraging softness and effeminacy and luxury. Okay? God doesn't want effeminate men. He wants manly men. Men that have the spirit, the spirit of a strong will. He doesn't need a strong body. He needs a strong inner man with a strong spirit and a strong will that will stand up to the winds of false doctrine and the, and the swirling winds of discontent around us and the lies that work against the truth. Lies are aimed against the truth. Will you stand in the battle? You don't let the newspaper do your thinking for you. You don't let the television do your thinking for you. You don't let the radio do your thinking for you. Men don't take their marching orders from any other playbook other than this one right here. I laugh at newspaper, radio, and TV report. <laughs> Are you kidding? You can't be effeminate of mind or effeminate of spirit or luxurious or soft. Hardness is what he's doing, and he left them there purposely to prove them and to try them. Is that going on in the modern church today? Is that the kind of stuff you hear when you go to church? Are you getting toughened up? Oh, comfort me, comfort me. I will comfort you. You know what the word comfort means? It's a compound work. C-O-M, com, with. With what? Fort. Forts. A fort is strong. It's to put a strengthful, a strengthful fort, a fortress inside of you. A strong mind and a strong heart and a strong shield and a strong sword. That's what he wants to do. We think of it like being petted, but that's not how God means it. Now, I know there's a, a dual meaning to it, and there is a little bit of comforting that way, but really that comforter is to put strength in you for the battle, and God leaves these things here. He's, he's leaving these nations to learn discipline. Discipline. You can't be a success without discipline, unless you're so incredibly gifted. Even in the NFL nowadays, brother, even a talented player in the NFL with great talent won't make it unless he disciplines himself. Discipline is needed. If ye continue on my word, then will ye be my disciples. A disciple has discipline. You can't get somewhere without discipline. I couldn't learn to play piano without discipline. I came home and I practiced. Every day. Drove everyone nuts. We finally moved the piano in the basement so I wouldn't drive them nuts. I had to practice the same scales over and over. Same thing. The same old thing. That's right. That's right. When I worked out in, in Taekwondo, I had to do the same push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups every day. Discipline. When I purposed that I wanted to go to school and I wanted to get into medical school, I had to discipline myself. You don't get into medical school by happenstance. Discipline. And you won't be a soldier of the cross unless you have some discipline. And another reason he left those nations, he left those nations, go to verse 2. Back where we were, Judges 3, verse 2. Only the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. My legs are so bad I can't stand anymore. I may have to get a stool. If there is a stool anywhere in this building, I would appreciate it so that I may sit now because they're both giving up. If there's a stool anywhere in this building, I will not make it through this. I have a torn cartilage and... The bad leg is gone and the good one is giving up from compensation. I apologize. Thank you. Discipline. And he left them to teach them war. Thank you. I apologize, folks. Oh, <laughs> Just pray for me. I have no health insurance. It's got to get better. 
All righty. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right. Let me get back to it. How can I be tough if I'm hurting? <laughs> it's a, listen, war is best learned by experience, not by classroom textbook study. You've got to get out in the battle. You don't learn to battle for the Lord Jesus Christ at Bible study. You learn to battle for the Lord Jesus Christ out there in the streets, out there at the workplace, out there with your family members, out there when you take that sword out of its shield, not to cut their heads off, but to help to show them through the Word of God that there's sin that needs to be removed from their life. War is learned by experience. I'm afraid to get out there. That's all right. Get out there. God's with you. You're not alone. I'm afraid to get out there. I might lose a battle. You will lose some battles. Everybody's lost battles. But you'll learn and you'll get better and you'll get stronger. And someone will ask a question you don't know, but you'll go back and you'll search out the matter like Job says. And you'll be ready the next time. And the more times that happen, the better you get. It's learned by experience. If the church wants to be triumphant, the church must be militant. And that's what God was doing with Israel. And another strange thing, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the Lord left these nations. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, and look carefully at verse 19. For there must, all, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest unto you. God allows heresies around us. Those are the Canaanites and the Hittites. Why didn't God take the heresy away? Why doesn't God get rid of the worldwide church of God? Why doesn't God get rid of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Why doesn't he get rid of the Mormons? Why doesn't he get rid of the, wet, the, the water dog church of Christ people? Why doesn't he get rid of all that stuff? He leaves those heresies to try you so that those may be manifest around you. You'll know an enemy and you, from the truth. He'll leave some problems in your life to toughen you up, Christian. Hey. So I can't do that. Hey, welcome to Christianity. You know who can? Jesus Christ. Amen. You let him live in you. You let him live through you and you can do these things. You try and do it without him and your strength, you can do nothing. But you can do all things through Christ which will strengthen you. So the first thing, before we even get into the first narrative of this chapter, God wants to show his wisdom. Back where we are in Judges chapter 3, he says, uh, I left these nations to prove them, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least, such as before knew nothing thereof. Listen, folks, we don't know the battle of what it was like at the time of the bringing forth of the Bible through the dark ages of Romanism. That was their battle. So, so what's God going to do? He say, well, now that I have the battle for them, and I've won that, and they have the Bible, and they have a, a, a printed Bible, I'll just leave them with nothing to do. No, I need to leave something for you so you can do something too. He's not expecting you to fight the battle of 100 years ago or 200 years ago. He's got one for you today and tomorrow to toughen you up so you'll know hardship, so you can be bred as a soldier, so you can learn discipline, and so you can learn it by experience, not by sitting in on a Thursday night Bible study, which is a good thing to do because it is good to have the right marching orders before you go out there. But do you go out there? Will you go out there? Will you at least pray for those that are out there? Will you at least support those that are out there? All right, Judges chapter 3. Let's look at the departure number 1. Now we'll get a, a historical narrative of what's happening. Judges 
chapter 3, verse 5. God wants to know, will you hearken to my commandments? Verse 5, And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. There's one group missing out of the seven there. I don't know if you're careful in your reading. <laughs> don't worry about it. Just think about it on your own. Do your own study. But he mentioned six of them. And verse 6, And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And there's the first thing, an evil alliance, an evil association, an evil marriage. There's the first step in departure from God, is being yoked up with the wrong people. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I see a born-again Christian marry a, a, a lost person. Yeah. It, there's there's going to be no more troublesome, trying, contentious relationship and marriage than there is between a born-again Christian and a lost person. Now, I understand if two lost people get married and then one gets saved, then that's different. But, but and, you know, and that happened to my wife and that happened to me and then the Lord brought us along and, and got us both saved. One got saved, got the other saved. But when you have a, a born-again Christian marry a lost person, you're looking for trouble. You're looking for trouble. And that's a good way to depart from God. Because that, that, that ball and chain that you married, no matter what sex it is, will just keep you from climbing the mount. Will drag you down into the valley of that mount and just keep you anchored down there. Maybe get your eyes off the mount entirely. And there's the first step in their departure right there. Verse 7, and then as soon as that happened, uh, verse 6, they took their daughters to be their wives, gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. It's a strange thing. That I know of a born-again Christian marrying a lost person, and uh, the lost person's a Roman Catholic, and isn't it a funny thing that they're going to have a Roman Catholic ceremony in a Roman Catholic church? Born again Christian. <laughs> He's setting foot in a Roman Catholic church having a Roman Catholic ceremony. It's inconceivable to God. Probably the worst church on the face of the planet in God's eyes is the Roman Catholic church. I mean, sends people to hell with the name of Jesus Christ on their lips. I mean, at least Islam sends you to hell with Allah on your lips. God doesn't get too mad at that. Allah is a nobody. But to take a person and to lie to them with a false gospel and teach them as if they know Jesus Christ and then watch them go to hell with that name, oh, that makes God real angry. To damn someone with his son's name, that really fear infuriates God. There's nothing that angers God more than that church because they use his son's name. They blaspheme the name of his holy son and lie to people with the name of his son. That's what they did to me. Any ex-Roman Catholics here? Any ex-Roman Catholics? Did you get saved in that church? Did you? Of course not. Someone brought the gospel to you. You got saved out of that church. Had you stayed in it, where would you go? To hell. And when you marry up with these lost people, you get serving their gods. Next thing you know, you're saying the rosary. And the Hail Mary. And singing the Ave Maria. False gods. Verse 7. And this is what God thinks of it. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the children of Christendom yeah. did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know what Christendom is? you have any idea what Christendom is? Christendom is, is this big thing that the Roman Catholic Church started. It's called the kingdom of God on earth. That's what the Pope is supposedly head over. He's the head over Christendom. That's the kingdom of God on earth. He supposedly is, what do they call him? The vicar of Christ. He's the one that sits in the chair and tells everyone what God wants. Christendom. And it includes Roman Catholicism and Anglicanism and uh, this monstrosity here. Presbyterianism. It's a letter from the Presbyterian Church. Dear Westminster 
members and friends. We're writing to inform you on October 2nd we will have a marriage ceremony for a same-sex couple at our church. This is a wonderful ceremony for a couple who love each other and feel called by God to spend the rest of their lives together. They'll make a public commitment one to another. It talks about how they've been Presbyterians in exile, but now the long-standing opposition of the Presbyterian Church of same-sex uh, marriage has now been put aside, and we now w welcome them. No scripture, no anything. Just the putrid, sick writings of defiled, unrighteous, unholy minds. Verse 7, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forget the Lord their God. They served Baalim and the groves. Baal is a false god, and Baalim are many false gods. You can serve Mary, you can serve St. Christopher, you can save uh, uh, St. Thomas, St. Jude, you can serve uh, the same-sex couples, you can serve anything you want, you can serve booze. That's a good God, right? Get you drunk, get those spirits in you. But that's how you forget the Lord God. And, that, and verse 8, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot. God getting angry. Breaking out into a sweat. His temperature is boiling. Someone you want to get angry, do you? And the Lord God was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathayim, the king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathayim eight years. Cushan Rishathayim. Cushan means black. And Rishathayim means iniquity. And it's the blackness of iniquity that comes out in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, now geographically, Mesopotamia was off to the east. Woe to them that replenished themselves from the east. And way out to the east, from a historical standpoint, this man was a man that wanted to expand his dominion, and he began moving westward across the regions, came into the land of Gilead, crossed the Jordan River, and began working himself into Israel. Look, that's a long trek. God could easily have wearied him out, but God let him maintain his strength so he could come in and spank his kids. And he lets the blackness of iniquity come in. If we want to forsake God, he will let the black spiritual thoughts of the enemy come into us if we are willing to forsake him. If we're willing to walk away from God, we're saying, I don't need your hand of protection. I do not need your light. I can make it on my own in this world. God says, you will go out in the dark with a blackness of iniquity will overtake you and I will permit it to overtake you. And you will hear about born-again Christians, goofy born-again Christians who are so far from God that they're dabbling in the occult and seances and the spirit world and, and tarot readings and crystal balls and believing things like this. Say, I don't believe that's so. I have articles at home. They have a Christian psychic association. It was founded in, in the mid-90s. And the Lord permits this because they've wandered away from his hand of protection. And the Lord was hot with anger. And the children of Israel, end of verse 8, they served Cushan, Rishathayim, eight years. Verse 9, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, it's interesting, now wait a second, let me stop for a minute, wait a second, wait a second. Let me see. We just married some heathen. We just learned to go to the groves of those heathen. We've just learned to bow to the idols of those heathen. We've made merry with those, M-E-R-R-Y, not, not uh, the other one. Uh, M -E -double, we've made merry with the heathen. We've drank their drink offerings, which coincidentally had a little E-T-O-H in it. You know what that is? That's ethanol. A little bit of hooch in there. Much better than grape juice, okay, for the lost man. 
And we've been doing all this and making merry with these heathens. And now all of a sudden, I'm under siege from this man from the east. And I'm in trouble. Why aren't you crying to the very idols that you've been bowing, bowing down to? Why don't your idols deliver you? Isn't that curious? When the good times roll and the spirits are flying and we're out there doing our own thing and living and living it up and eating and drinking and being merry and everything's going fine and ignoring God and forsaking God and then all of a sudden we get in trouble and we cry out to God. Isn't that curious? Does that make sense? Shouldn't we go to the very people we've been carousing with? How would you respond if you were God? They just... We're just thinking here. How would you respond if you were God? And you just watched your kids flip the bird at you, go their way, do what they want, get involved with all kinds of iniquity and wickedness that you warned them not to, and then get themselves all tangled up in a tar pit with spider webs and all kinds of problems, and then they cry to you. Now we see the goodness of God. Oh, our God is good. Our God is the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. How many chances? Oh, seven times 70, Jesus says. Seven times 70. You know, he, he does obey what he says. He does believe his own words. And when the children of Israel, verse 9, cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel. Amen. My people need help and I'll give them a deliverer. You're out there in the midst of the sin and the blackness of iniquity that you put yourself in by walking away from the hand of God and you cry out and lo and behold, along comes a messenger, an angel of God, someone that meets you right where you are to help pick you up, read some Bible with you, pour in the bomb of Gilead, bring you back to church and clean you up. Boy, is that good? Yeah. You ever been there? You ever been helped? And here comes the Lord. Here he comes raising up a deliverer. He raises up this particular deliverer at this time from a historical standpoint. The deliverer is a man named Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Othniel is from the tribe of Judah. The first uh, deliverer that God raises up is uh, a son of Judah. Judah was the strong tribe. Judah was the largest tribe. It was the most powerful tribe. It was the lion-like tribe. And Othniel means the powerful one. And verse 10, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. He judged Israel. He called out and he said, Folks, what we're doing is wrong. Folks, this is injustice. Folks, God doesn't want us here. Folks, God wants us to win this battle and get back to the place where he wants us. And the Spirit of the Lord gave him strength and he went out to war. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle to bring someone back that's fallen into sin. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, there, there were the children of Israel overtaken in their own fault. It was their fault. You get into sin, guess whose fault it is? It's not your wife's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your boss's fault. It's not your kid's fault. It's not the relative's fault. It's your fault. You get into sin, it's your fault. I get into sin, it's my fault. We get into that fault, someone sees us, we cry out, God sends someone, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. God will send spiritual ones to restore. Now the amazing thing about the one that does the restoration process, on one hand, he's got the sword and he's fighting the enemy. On the other hand, he has the bomb of Gilead and he's meekly ministering to the one that's wounded. It's, it's quite an interesting balance that God does there. You know, it's like that old skit about the guy that was half man and half woman on one side and real tender on the other. And that's the way it works. There's meekness 
to the one that's wounded. And there's the battle of the might of someone taking up the shield of faith and the sword against the enemy and shooing them away. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Othniel went out there as a strong, powerful one to make war against the enemy, not against the one that was wounded. Interesting. Sometimes we go up and beat up our brother when he's down. The way of transgression is hard. Yeah, I figured that out. That's why I'm trying to get out of here. That's why I'm calling for help. So, so it, 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 it requires meekness. It, it, it would take the spirit of God. If you try and do it in your spirit, you will you'll make a mess of the whole thing. Be like sending a child in an operating room with a scalpel and an orthopedic drill. A five-year-old. Patient's asleep. You may now begin. <laughs> you which are spiritual. I need someone that's older and has been through a few things like maybe medical school and internship and residency before I put those <laughs> tools in his hand and let him work on that sleeping patient. <laughs> You've been there. <laughs> He's been in the R ER with me, Dr. Eubanks. All right. And the spirit of the Lord, verse 10, came upon him and he judged Israel and he went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushan, Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, that's in the battle, and his hand prevailed against Cushan, Rishathayim, and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Look, the Lord can beat the blackness of iniquity with the light of truth. The Lord can shine the light and push back the blackness. The Lord can dispel and cleanse the iniquity. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. His blood can cleanse that. And someone comes along and applies and restores. What a blessing. So we see the first departure and we see God's deliverer. Now the next one in the same chapter, after 40 years of rest, verse 12, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And we're going to see the the hoop of history and the roller coaster of repentance and unrepentance and black backsliding as we just go down and down and merrily round and round in the book of the Judges. And they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And how's the Lord deal with it? And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Why? Because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Eglon, I'm trying to remember that the name... Eglon means uh, chariot, chariot. And I remember Pharaoh had those chariots, and the chariots were weapons of war. Uh, it's pretty much defined in uh, Psalm 46, I think, verses 8 and 9. And, and the chariots come forth, and, and he, now he's bringing the artillery against the Christian. He's bringing the, the mechanization against. In other words, the blackness of iniquity was an inner thing. Now we're bringing some outer attacks against the Christian. The Lord's going to work inward in the spirit. He also has to work on the body. The Lord wants to sanctify the spirit and the best he can, that body. He wants to sanctify that body. He wants to get that body to the point where it too is, is purpose to follow the Lord. You get that spirit in line, and then that spirit gets that body in line. But right now you do evil again, and the Lord allows some attacks against the body. And Eglon comes. Why? Because they've done evil in the sight of the Lord. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, many of you are sick. sick. Many of you are weak. Why? Because you've done against the commandments of God. You've done against the ordinances of God. And God will allow attacks in the body to occur. I'm not saying all sickness is due to that, but I bet in this modern Laodicean church, most of it's due to that. I'm sorry. But you just look around at a, at a modern American Laodicean Christian and how they live. I mean, look, folks, let's be honest. 
God would like a tithe out of you. A three-way tithe. A tithe of your time. Can you give him one-tenth of your day? He gives you 24 hours. You can't give him 10% of the day? Come on. You can't give 10% of your day to the God that saved you and just gave you 24 hours? 10% of your day in a combination of Bible reading, prayer, and witnessing. You can't do that? That's only two hours and, help me son, what's the math? Two hours and 20 minutes? Two hours and 15 minutes? That's what it is. It's not much. A tithe of your time. A tithe of your talent. You give your talent to the world. You lend your hands and your feet and your body to the boss. You can't give a tithe of your talent to your Lord. A tithe of your treasure. You can't give one-tenth of your treasure to the Lord. First off, i got news for you. He allow, any treasure you got, He allowed you. He gave you the strength. He gave you the ability. He gave you the resources and the opportunity to get it in the first place. I don't care whether you inherited it or you earned it. He could have laid you out as a dribbling retard with no ability to make a nickel. And, and we can't give him a tithe of our time and our talent and our treasure? Well, the, the tithe is an Old Testament. It's Old Testament. It's under the law. Actually, the tithe is before the law. It's Abraham. It's during the law. And it's after the law. If you can't tithe under grace, that's a disgrace. Amen. All right. They had done evil, and so the Lord brought the enemy against them. <laughs> they got, got financial problems, do you? I wonder why. Anyways, verse 13. And he gathered unto him, this is Eglon, the king of Moab, the children of Ammon and Amalek. He didn't come alone. He brought two more compatriots with him, two more warriors with him. He tripled up on the size of the battle and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of the palm trees. Now that's Jericho. That's right across the border of Jordan, not far from Jerusalem. I mean, he's making a strategic outpost right there where he is prepared to make a move on the capital city. Verse 14. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. 18 years. The last time, the duration was eight years. Now, it's 18 years. What's that mean? Sin is going to take you further than you want to go. It's going to keep you longer than you want to stay. It's going to cost more than you want to pay. And you'll see this, how the bondage gets longer and harder. Why? Because you have the knowledge of God. You know your master's will. You're without excuse. Now, if you're brand new in the faith, I understand. But if you've been around the block a few times, you've been saved longer than three years, you know a fair amount unless you've been hiding out of church. And same with this nation right here. Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. God is good. This is going to happen time and time and time again. And the Lord is good. And he raised up a deliverer. This one is Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. Now, now, I just want to clue you in on something. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Judges before. You've ever read that book? If you ever read the book of Judges, there's going to be a number of stories of departure in the book. We're looking at the second departure here. They pretty much run through about seven periods of departure, ending with Samson. And then after Samson, I can't remember what chapter is. I think it might be chapter 17. Let me make sure I got it right. Chapter 17 and 18, there's a story about a man of Mount Ephraim named Micah. There's a story there. And then chapter... 19 and 20 and 21 
there's that awful story about the Sodomites in that one region of Benjamin that caused a terrible civil war to occur where that one harlot is chopped up in pieces and all the nation gets together and they fight against the Benjamites. Now those two stories occurred before what I'm reading to you here. Okay, I told you the book is not chronological. So when I get to this Benjamite right here, when you finish reading that story about the civil war against Benjamin, they had killed all but 600 Benjamites. Benjamin had been practically wiped out. There was only 600 of them left. So the first deliverer was from the biggest tribe, and the second deliverer is from the smallest tribe. Why? Because God can win with great or small if they'll submit to his hand. Well, well, if someone's really in trouble, only a pastor, one of the leaders, can win him back and help him back. No, no, if you're a faithful, Bible-reading, praying Christian that is spiritual, God can take a small thing and use to deliver someone that's in trouble. We can all get in the battle. It's not just the leaders out on the front lines. It's the people all the way back. Sometimes a spy gets in the camp and the leaders are out there fighting and there's a couple of whacks back at the base, women, you know, and, they're, and, they, and they fight the battle and they win. God can use someone that's small in winning a battle. God can win with great or small. It's God that's going to win. Yeah. Will you just submit and yield? So let's see how this battle goes here. He raises up this man named Ehud. Ehud, uh, his, his name means um, strong. Even though he's small, he was strong. His strength is in the Lord. This man is a man left-handed. God's going to take advantage of this because most people are right-handed. God's going to use him in, a, in an area where you think he, he couldn't win. And the average person would look at him and says he has a weakness. He's a left-handed man. He's not as talented as a right-handed man. He doesn't have the skills of a right-handed man. And God's going to take this apparently small man from a small tribe and he's going to give him strength and win him a battle. And and by him, the children of Israel sent a present under Eglon, the king of Moab. So here they are, and this guy is reigning in his place of the city of palm trees, and he's probably exacted a taxation. And people had to come and bring the tax to him. And one day, a contingent comes led by this man named Ehud, the Benjamites. There's only a few of us left, and we're going to bring our taxation to you with a little bit of a present too. Now, Ehud, verse 16, made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. Now this is going to be a cloak and dagger story right here, folks. Okay, just like they have these spy movies. And, and he doesn't have his big sword. He's got this little dagger. And usually the sword was over here on this side because right-handed men had it on the left side. He's got this little thing hidden on the right side. No one would even expect to search him there. He got right down the pat down as he went through security. And he's got that little thing hidden on the wrong side, that little one cubit dagger there. And there's the king just sitting luxuriously on his big throne and just uh, eating a little bit of, of fried grease and grits and things like that. And, uh, and verse 18, and when he had made an end to offer the present and the contingent, they, oh, here's our present king and we're so thankful. Uh, we, we've enjoyed much liberty with you as the king and we're so thankful you're watching out for us and you're a great king and you flatter him and you give him, you butter him up a little bit just before the kill and you, and you tell him how wonderful it is. And he sent away the people that bear the present. He says, I have a very special present for the king. I'm going to send the rest of my people away. And that, that lets the king's guard down saying, it's just one man alone. I mean, if he wanted to overtake me, he doesn't even of his bodyguards anymore. He doesn't have his soldiers with him. Everyone's been sent out. And there's just this one man alone. Verse 19. But he, let me see, uh, is that where I was? Uh, verse 18. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. Now imagine for one moment there, maybe he was starting to shake a little bit and thinking, oh my goodness, this is the moment of truth. 
you know, when, when Michael Corleone's with the Turk there. And now, now this is the moment. He's got to do that thing. And he's thinking about it. He's I've got to go to the bathroom quickly. And so he turns out there by, by Gilgal, and he looks out there over those quarries. Now, you know what's out there in the quarries of Gilgal? The idols that had been built by this king. The very groves and the idols that his people were bowing down to. And as he looked at that wickedness and he began to hate evil, it strengthened his spirit and said, I'm on a mission here. I can't give up now. I mean, there's wickedness to be overtaken. This stuff bringing my people down. I mean, sometimes you want to get that, that righteous anger stirring up in you. You just read the, a Catholic catechism about lying to someone, about how somehow some guy gets up there with some phony Latin words, abracadabra, yabba dabba do, and turns a dirty little wafer supposedly into the body of Jesus Christ and lies to some poor sucker. And you look at that thing, you say, I got to destroy this thing. I got to break this stronghold down. We got to tear this thing up. And he turned from those quarries at Gilgal, verse 19, and he said, King, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And the king said, Keep silence. I want to hear this. He's got a present for me, and it's a secret. I love to hear secrets. Maybe he's going to tell me about some, some uprising that's up against me. Maybe he's going to come into the confessional booth and tell me something. Uh, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And he's, he's, he's just sitting there waiting. And Ehud came unto him. He was sitting in his summer parlor. Just, just sitting out there like Jesus talked about that man in Luke chapter 12. And uh, he said, I got this man and this man had many goods and many fruits. He said, I'm going to build bigger and greater barns. Soul, oh, I have much goods laid up for many years in my summer parlor. I'll take ease. I'll drink. I'll eat. And I'll be merry. And he's just sitting there relaxed and just fat and waiting for the kill. And then Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee, verse 20. And he arose out of his seat. Isn't that interesting? He arose out of his seat. You see, this is, this is God about to do judgment through this man to this wicked king. You want to know when God speaks judgment to you, you stand on your feet. No matter who you are. And one day everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. No one will be sitting in a summer chair before God. They'll be standing. God will be on the throne. Stand up. Zechariah 14, verse 4. Real picture of the judgment there. In Zechariah chapter 14 and in verse 4. And he shall stand on his feet on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to have these people stand before them in verse 12. And it'll be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away out of their mouth. Stand when God gives the judgment message to all people. Going to stand that man right up. And this man stood up and Ehud took that left hand and he, he took that dagger from his right thigh and he thrust it into the belly and the haft went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of that belly and the dirt came out. That's a uh, Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14, Isaiah 57, verse 20. It's a little medical fact. I don't know if you're aware of that. But when people uh, die unexpectedly, all of a sudden their bowels are release and the rectum releases and the dirt comes out. And that's a real mess with a fat guy like that. Now that little, that little blade that he had there, it's curious that he had this uh, dagger, verse 16. This little dagger had two edges and it was a cubit long. You know what that's a picture of? Remember he used it with his left hand? You remember what, what Jesus said? He said, uh, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And I've taught you what that means. Uh, you hold your Bible in your hands. What's in the left hand? What's in the right when it's open? The Old Testament's in the left. The New Testament's on the right. You want to cast a net to draw someone to catch them, you use the right side, you use the gospel. God wasn't trying to catch this guy to save him. God was going to judge this guy. He pulled the dagger. He pulled the law out of the left side. He took that, that law and he stabbed him right through for breaking the law of God. It's administration of death. 
That's what it is. It's on the left hand. Folks, the ministration of death is for the enemy. The average lost man is not your enemy. The lost ruler is your enemy. The ruler of spiritual wickedness in high places. The sons of the devil are your enemy. Lost people are not sons of the devil. They're sons of Adam. Religious leaders, John 8, 44, are sons of the devil. You get a chance to have a nice meeting with the Pope one day. And that's an opportunity to take the left hand and tell him from, I, from uh, Exodus chapter 20, this is the dagger you'd give the Pope. This is what you do to men like that. Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, Mr. Pope. I am the Lord thy God. There is no vicarious filet dea on earth. I am the Lord thy God. Verse 3, Pope, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Take the fish hat off. Throw the wafers down. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What are these things around here, Mr. Pope? Yeah. Or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. I got pictures of you bowing down, kissing a statue. Nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Mr. Pope, you hate the God of the Bible. Have a nice day. That's how you deal with him. And you walk out. And you let that fat cash cow that sits in the Vatican with his billions of dollars slump in his summer chair and think about that for a while. That's how you handle a meeting like that. That's what Billy Graham should have done when he met the Pope. Right. Instead of kissing his finger and saying, we're brethren. That's right. Yeah. Amen. All right. Verse 23, Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him, and locked them. And as he was gone out, the servants came. And when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Oh, <laughs> surely he covers his feet in the summer chamber. In other words, he's taken another nap. The fat guy overate and fell asleep. Too much turkey, too much tryptophan. Going to watch a few ball games. And they sat outside, and they tarried till they were ashamed. And somebody said, What are we doing? We're getting paid to be his bodyguard. It's been three, four hours now. We're supposed to be standing around him. Behold, they opened not the doors of the parlor. He opened not the doors, the, that's the king. Therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried, and passed beyond the quarries, and escaped into Seroth. And it came to pass, when he was come, he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. Remember, he's from a very small tribe. He's only got about 500 brethren, but Ephraim has 20,000 men of war. And he blows that trumpet, and here come the Ephraimites to fight with him. And he said, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. And they went down and took the fords of Jordan from Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time 10,000 men all lusty, all men of valor. There escaped not a man, a, a man. And so Moab was subdued under the hand of Israel and the land had rest four score years. Those Moabites were men of valor, but they were lusty. You know one of the problems with a lost soldier? Too much booze and too many broads. That's the truth. That's just the outright truth. Too much wine, too many women. Too much alcohol, too much adultery. A real soldier has discipline. A real soldier has discipline. He fights the battle, and afterwards he has a Coke or a Pepsi, and then he prays, thanks the Lord for the victory, and reads his Bible and gets ready for the next battle. Has a glass of grape juice. It's sad. It's sad the way lost men fight and they lose. It perverts their mind. It perverts judgment. <clears throat> and we see this uh, battle here. And, and you know, this second departure, and Eglon, the fat man, took over. 
and took a cloak and dagger story. But folks, you know what you got to do? You got to kill the fat man. Yeah. You got to kill the fat man. Yeah. Fat man may not be the Pope. The fat man may be you or me. It may be our flesh. Yeah. Maybe a part of our flesh that's lording over us that we put ourselves under tribute to it. Yeah. We need some help. You know what kills the fat man? The law. That puts the flesh to death. That's like the nails and the daggers that will settle that thing down. Christian, we're not beyond the law. We're supposed to fulfill the law. Say, I don't want to do it openly. Make it a cloak and dagger story. Do it in your own bedroom. Do it in your own closet with God. You need some help? Uh, get the Jubilee trumpet and call the Ephraimites. Get some prayer partners with you. That battle can be won. God never loses a battle. Departure. Departure from the living God and departure from the faith loses battles. Verse 31, and the story ends very quickly, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. <laughs> and he also delivered Israel. Shamgar means the cupbearer. Now it's interesting. Real quick, go to Judges chapter 5 and watch verse 6. Real quick, you'll see his name mentioned again. And this is a prayer, a song of Deborah. And it says, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through the byways. That's curious. What does that mean? Now, I just read over here that Shamgar was a deliverer. But I told you, didn't I just tell you a few minutes ago? The deliverance was local. It wasn't national. So there was one region where there was a deliverer having success, and there was another region where Deborah was living that was under bondage. Folks, there are places that are safe churches that are having success, and there are churches in bondage. Right now, the Church of Jesus Christ has no king, no King James Bible. Every church does that which is right in its own eyes. And in a few places, God raises up a deliverer with a faithful leader, and there's safety there. Amen. And in other places, it's unoccupied. There's, there's nothing happening there. Yeah. Shamgar means a cupbearer. His father, Anath, means a granting an answer. His father probably prayed, Lord, raise up a deliverer to my region. Lord, raise up a deliverer to our region. Lord, and God says, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll, I'll make one of your boys a preacher. I'll make him faithful. I'll let him raise up a church. That'll be safe. Departure from the faith results in departure from the living God. If you've departed... You know what you do? You cry into God. He'll deliver you. He'll, he'll raise up a deliverer. He'll put you in a place where there's a shamgar, a cupbearer, that bears the Lord's cup in truth. And give you a place where it's safe. God is good. Praise the Lord. Next week we'll look at Deborah and Barak and start looking at the chapters of another departure and another deliverance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of our God. Uh, help us, Lord. Um, Lord, help us when the blackness of iniquity comes our way, uh, uh, of the inner spirit, and, and the, uh, uh, the summer parlor of laziness and fatness comes upon us, Lord. Help us to be delivered from those things. Thank you for being faithful and raising a deliverer when we cry. Thou art good. Oh, the wisdom and the knowledge, the riches of our God. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.